welcome to this masterclass. My name is Stefan Morsch. I'm a partner with SKW Schwarz uh, in Munich. I have advised entrepreneurs and investors when starting a venture in financing rounds in periods of growth when struggling towards exits uh, for many years. In this session, I would like to draw your attention uh, to some legal topics you should consider when starting your business and which will help you to save a lot of time, money and trouble at a later stage. Of course, I know that legal stuff is not at the top of the priority list uh, of founders. However, I'm sure that you want to do everything you can to set yourself up for success from the very beginning. An investor who attends uh, Bits and Brazels this year once said, a startup messed up at its foundation cannot be fixed at a later stage. I fully agree uh, to this sentence. So let's go here on my top 10 uh, topics you should keep in mind. First of all, you should understand the regulations that affect your industry and the costs associated with compliance uh, with the rules and regulations. I was recently approached by the founders of a prop tech startup who sought legal advice on the corporate structure uh, of their future business. They presented a tax memo to me uh, and a highly sophisticated business presentation. Their business model included the raising of funds from individuals and the provision of payment services. What the founders had completely ignored is that their business idea was not only highly regulated, but required a license from the German Financial Supervisory Authority, BAFE. Uh, you can imagine how I felt and how they felt when I had to tell them at a quite late stage um, uh, of their business um, development that their entire business model did not work at all as planned. Therefore, do a proper research and look for advice regarding the regulatory environment um, when starting a business. And keep in mind that not only the uh, typical suspects like uh, pharmaceuticals or financial products are regulated, but that many other uh, business areas might be subject to regulation um, in your jurisdiction. Transfer the IP from founders to the company. All startups are based on a business idea from their founders. Such business idea often includes intellectual property, intellectual property in the broadest sense, a technical innovation, a business concept, a software code, or a name. You will agree that uh, the IP belongs in the hands of the company and should not stay with the founders. The IP forms an important part of the valuation of a startup or is even the only and sole value driver. It is in the interest of all founders that any IP is transferred to the company and not only licensed, of course, to the extent legally possible. The longer you wait, the more difficult the transfer may be, in particular, if one of the team members and IP owners um, has left the company. In the meanwhile, of course, investors will examine you very carefully if full and unrestricted availability of the IP with the startup is secured. Accept that your co founders are not only friends but also business partners. Successful startups are rarely launched by one single founder, only by but at least two or three founders. There are many reasons for that. You will know better than I do. But for instance, the lack of exchange of ideas on the founder's level or the difficulties to obtain finance for that. So if you consider to set up a new business with someone else, you should not only be very honest to yourself about whether you have the right team with the right capabilities, values and determination. You should also anticipate that one of your co-founders is losing interest, is running out of money, is getting frustrated because things take much longer than expected. Or she or he is intending to pursue another business. Or even worse, there are unbridgeable differences 
in the founder's team on strategy or operational topics. So what happens if such founders shares in the company if she or he decides to leave? This should be clearly regulated in a shareholders agreement when starting a business, for instance, by vesting provisions or by a competition restriction. Keep your cap table clean and short. A few years ago, I advised the merger of two e-commerce startups, each with more than 20 shareholders, founders, families and friends, both private and institutional seed investors, round A investors and employees from the first beginning, some of whom had already left the companies in the meanwhile. In both companies, the cap table had never been cleaned up um, as nobody was willing to pay money to other shareholders for the acquisition of existing shares. But of course, everybody wanted to invest in the company and give fresh money in the business. The merger of the two companies was a nightmare because for various reasons, the consent of all parties was required. For instance, the major investors insisted to bind each shareholder to new tag along and drag along provisions and of course to the new waterfall. And things didn't become better after the merger with an entity with more than 40 shareholders and some of them holding less than 0.4% in the share capital. Each shareholders meeting required a physical meeting and had to be convened with two weeks prior notice and in writing because not all shareholders were willing to waive the formal requirements for the calling and holding of a shareholders meeting. We ended up with several shareholders agreements which were overlapping and not consistent because the company had virtually lost contact to some minor shareholders. Um, it's quite clear that this is not a good basis uh, for an exit. Comply with legal formalities. If an agreement states that any amendment requires written form, you should not agree on an amendment by an exchange of email or by handshake only. This is not written form. I know that legal formalities are annoying and quite often come across as an anachronism in particular if you live in a digital environment and do a lot of stuff online. However, as long as the legal environment is as it is, you do better to comply with it. Not only will investors and their advising advisors during their due diligence make your life a living hell if they discover too many legal problems. Also, your trusted business partners or long-standing employee might turn into a bad guy who shameless makes advantage of legal gaps and does not remember any more what you had supposedly agreed in a telephone conversation a few weeks ago. Therefore, to have something in writing, if written form is required by law, helps a lot. As founders, you are facing many difficulties and challenges. To be clean on the legal side is not always, but quite often a rather low-hanging fruit. You should save the problems for more important stuff than a missing signature or miscalculation or wrong denomination of the number of shares. Don't base your business model and your business as such on complex structures. Keep it simple. This applies to your corporate structure and to your internal organization as well. I have seen many startups with dormant subsidiaries abroad. Think carefully. Do you really need a subsidiary in another country or can you start with a branch until your market entry has, uh, has a proven success? Of course, many reasons to establish a subsidiary exist. For instance, a legal entity might be required um, to obtain public grants or a subsidiary in form of a legal entity is required for ring fencing purposes to prevent uh, your, your liability or there are certain tax advantages. All good, but having a subsidiary is not an end in itself. Another example is 
employee participation. Of course, you want to provide your staff with the best tax optimized structure, but it is really worse to set up a shareholder structure for a handful of employees, perhaps with a vehicle to bundle the employee's interest or with a trustee structure. Of course, a simple virtual stock option program might be tax-wise less favorable to the employees, but it saves a lot of money and costs and other resources. And finally, your internal structure. How many management levels do you really need? Let your organization grow with your business rather than being under pressure to grow your business in order to be able to pay your organization. Protect your IP. You should seek trademark protection wherever possible. Business name, logos and the like. But intellectual property goes beyond registered IP rights and includes copyrights and business secrets as well. Therefore, make sure that your employment agreements provide for transfer of all employment-related IP rights from the employee to the company if the applicable laws don't do so. Anyway, more important are, of course, service agreements, which might be governed differently from employment agreements. Another topic are business secrets. The three lands are, are business secrets such as business plans, concepts, customer list, and the like. In many jurisdictions, there exists the concept of protection of business secrets, but that requires, of course, that the respective concept or business plan or customer list is kept secret. So if you present the details of your business concept on each industry event, it will be hard to argue that the concept is still secret and the protection under the applicable laws will most probably be denied. Finally, I would like, I would like to draw your attention to the use of open source software. I've seen many startups uh, which had to accept a major reduction in valuation as they were not able to market their software due to the use of OSS components. Don't assume that your workers can be independent contractors. Many founders think that they can save money, in particular social security contributions, by hiring freelancers and by classifying workers as independent contractors rather than employees. However, most countries have comprehensive regulations and case law on the qualification of workers as freelancers or employees. Even Uber failed um, in many jurisdictions with its attempt to have the drivers regarded as independent contractors. A software engineer who is working 40 hours per week and 220 days per year for a business is most probably not a freelancer. Have a proper accounting and reporting in place. You need a proper accounting and reporting for two reasons. First of all, you need a reliable controlling system from the beginning. Where does your business deviate from the business plan, which will happen all the time? How long will the cash last? The second reason are the investors. To get business funding is difficult. To get business funding without proper accounting and reliable business, uh, reliable figures is probably more or less impossible. If your accounting is a mess or if your most recent figures are six months old, you will lose all credibility before investors have even started to look into your brilliant business idea in more detail. Therefore, keep your accounting in order and up to date, even if you would prefer to spend the money in another software engineer or salesperson rather than in an accountant. This will not only help you to run your business based on certain facts and figures, but helps you to be prepared for a due diligence exercise by investors at very short notice. Finally, do not only use templates. Of course, it is easy to download standard documents like terms and conditions, employment contracts, or even a virtual stock option program. 
it is quick and cheap or even free of charge. But ask you the question, do these templates really fit for your business? For instance, using a standard employment contract with a post-contractual non-compete obligation sounds great, but have you ever considered that in your jurisdiction you might be obliged to pay your former employee a compensation for his or her compliance with such obligation and that you cannot easily get rid of such clause? Are you sure that the place of jurisdiction which you inserted in the general terms and conditions template is legally effective? Of course, you do not need a lawyer for each and every contract. This applies for other advisors as well, for instance, tax advisors. But seeking advice before entering into a new major agreement is in many cases worth the effort, time and costs. So what is my conclusion? Of course, not all the aspects I mentioned in the last couple of minutes will be relevant for you and probably most of them will not be new or come uh, as a surprise. And of course, legal stuff is just one challenge and potential minefield of founders. But often enough, there are mistakes which could have been avoided easily and which make your job much more difficult at a later stage. So please allow for a certain sensitivity and awareness for legal requirements in your startup. Avoiding the expense of using professionals for specialized services may result in cost savings uh, at short notice, but also in mistakes that will cost you time and money in the long run. Keep in mind that there are many associations and individual advisors uh, who give tips to young starters at no or a very low costs. Thank you.